So your resume, if you were using planetary influences, again, this is um, this is a mercurial document. You know, it's your curriculum vitae. This is where I worked. This is what I did. Now, say you're one in eight hundred people. You reduce your chances by working on a cover letter, because only 40% of people apply a job for a job with a cover letter, which is remarkably low to me. But, um, and some people truly don't want a cover letter. But your cover letter is not Mercury. Your cover letter is Venus. Because your cover letter doesn't say, this is where I work, this is what I've done. Your cover letter says, one of these places I, you know, let me explain this one part of my resume because what I did was amazing and this is why you want to hire me because I am the type of person who can open a new bank branch. I am the type of person who can, uh, you know, take over X department in decline and turn around. I am the type of person who increased sales by 400%. Whatever it is, you flip that around and you tell the story of it. This is your love letter. This is to make your employer fall in love with you. So you consecrate that to Venus. And again, you put that master copy on your Venusian altar, like Venus spells, or you call Aphrodite, or, uh, you know, or Zulu, or whoever you want, um, to influence. Or you just, you know, you, you, you send it out with that vine. It doesn't have to be, you know, calling upon a specific being. You can imbue something directly because you yourself are a spiritual power. Um, and then, you know, hopefully this gets you down to the interview and then you get to the interview and then there are ways to mojo up the interview, like I've said, uh, different ways of using eye contact, words. And these are both mundane and magical. If you know NLP, you can use a little bit of NLP that borders on magic. And in Sorcerer's Secrets, I have a whole chapter on like how to use embedded commands, but also see them emanating from parts of the body, which is a trick I learned in Tibet with mantras. So it's all kind of more complicated than we have time for. What time are we wrapping? We need to be out of here by four. We'll need about you know ten minutes to. All right. So we'll, I'll I'll stop at like fifteen, and then we'll do questions. That's great. All right. So yeah, we don't want to get too wrapped up in, in minutia. Um, so then, you know, after your interview, you do something that only 4% of applicants do. Yeah. You send a physical thank you letter. And again, you know, Venus, it, it's there to ingratiate yourself. I know somebody who, she works, her husband works for, no, it's the other way around. She works for a company. She wanted her husband get a job with said company. He applied. He got interviewed. They waited. They waited for two or three weeks. Finally, the hiring manager came to her and said, so I had this interview with your husband. And I'd love to hire him. I never got a thank you letter. He knows somebody at the company. They are ready to hire him. They were offended that they did not get a thank you letter. Yet only 4% of people send them. And again, you know, dealing with the economy these days, it's a numbers game. I mean, if you want to attend, Gordon from RuneSoup was saying that, you know, he went to a bar in New York that was having, you know, open interview or audition for bartenders. And he said, the place was packed. He said, I thought in your book you were exaggerating about there being 600 people for every professional position. He's like, it's, you're not exaggerating. There were easily people poured out in the street for one position. Just crazy. So that's what I mean by breaking the goal down and using macro enchantment as the overall guiding, this is the goal, help me steer, and then micro enchantment. Okay, this is the next step, ping it with magic. This is the next step, ping it with magic. This is the next step, ping it with magic. Does everybody understand the micro enchantment, macro enchantment yeah. principle? That is super key because magic is, is not science. Magic can fail. 
magic yeah. uh, doesn't always manifest the way we want it to. So we improve our chances a great deal if we have something important and we approach it from multiple angles. Now, there are, there are those people who I know that are complete skeptics about magic, and they'll say, well, you know, if you're doing all the things that you need to do to get a job anyway, how do you even know if the magic works? I don't care. I'm long past that, kids. I'm not, you know, I'm not wondering doing a paranormal show or like, you know, I wonder if ghosts are real. Let's find out. For me, I know that magic works. I've seen enough weird stuff. I don't need more weird stuff. I want practical stuff that works. And at the end of the day, if I can't isolate whether it was the magic that did it or a well-written resume that did it, I just don't care. You got the job. You opened the business. You, you made a successful retirement. Whatever it is, that's what you're going for, not to tickle yourself with weird vibes. Yeah. But, but, but I can tell over and over again, the last part of the spell is act in accordance on the material plane. So I'm supposed to be doing all those mundane things anyway. You are supposed to be doing all these mundane things anyway. So, you know, Louis Martinet has a saying that I, I use a lot. And it's, it's first comes the working, then comes the work. And so the only thing that I've done is to change that to be, well, no, the working and the work have to coincide together, step by step, hand in hand, the whole way. It's not a one than the other. So that's the, really the only good thing. Sometimes you can't really do all these things. What if you're a person that like, just out of high school and you want a professional job? Or you want to start being on? I mean, you need to go through all these so-called things and it's not producing anything. Well, is it really realistic? And then this whole thing about um, you know, you have to do these things versus, I guess, being submissive the way their spirit is stuff in. Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that. Because most people do sit around, you know, you're guided by intuition. They're, they sit around and they're guided by their intuition, but, or, or their spiritual influences. And that's, that's fine, that type of guidance is great. What I mean by getting bossed around is, I mean, don't turn it over to them. Don't just say, I will do whatever you want me to do, and I have no income. You know, you're, you, you bring up a great example. Uh, a person who has a high school diploma who wants a professional job. Like I said earlier, in the 90s, these were easy to come by. If you had a high school diploma and you could operate a computer, you get a professional job. You could start a .com. You started, well, you can still start, you can always start your own business. Right. That's one great thing about entrepreneurial business. If you, most, I think some, like, ridiculous amount of billionaires in the country don't have college degrees. You know, neither Steve Jobs nor Bill, Bill Gates have a college degree. Um, you know, people that get out of prison. I always say, you know, you can't find a job, start a business. You don't have to fill out that application that says I committed a felony. Um, yes, the business might fail, but, you know, it's better to try and fail than do nothing. But, you know, the, the point that you're bringing up is a really good one. You're in a tight spot. But rather than just saying, you know, okay, Lord, or goddess, or whoever, you know, I'm just going to follow what you said in my path. What I'm saying is, give me the strength to start looking for a way to get what I want. So, how does somebody get what they want in that position? Well, long term, they have to solve the degree problem. Thankfully, they work, they, we live in a world, although we have unprecedented obstacles, we also have unprecedented opportunities. We have ways of getting certified for things very quickly. And if you're smart and you have any money that can help you, including charities that you can just go to and they'll, they'll help you find the money to pay for things. If you're on unemployment, you can get unemployment to pay for certifications like project management certifications. 
Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, truck driving certifications, uh, which to me, you know, if it pays well, it doesn't have to be a desk job. But, you know, if, if, if it, a lot of the wealthy people that I know, like that have retirement in the bag, they're plumbers and electricians and, you know, things like that. Um, there's a lot of people I know who work, you know, to have the I shower, you know, in the morning before work jobs who, you know, their finances are a disaster. A few people that, you know, have to use their hands every day that, you know, actually have their finances, all their ducks in a row. But there are ways to get certified for things in the short term. Then you can take advantage of things like Thomas Edison in, in New Jersey. We're lucky enough to have a real online school, not that's actually regionally accredited, not like these things you see commercials for, but you know, national accreditation, which is not ideal. Um, but you know, even then, like you do what you can do. Think I know, you know, we in New Jersey we have a sheriff that was just fired for having a degree from a diploma. You know, one of these places you pay like 600 bucks for a life experience degree. They basically provide you a degree and, you know, <laughs> it's a bachelor's and they take your money. But you know what? It'll get you in the door some places. Mm -hmm. So if you're absolutely against the wall, cannot find meaningful work, I don't blame people that take advantage of that. If they, if they you know, in this world, people are up to you know, cheat you this way and that. If you have to resort to what Gordon would say, a black hat technique to get your foot in the door, get your foot in the door, then get a real degree, for God's sake, so that when it comes yeah. time, you know, when, when you're going through something where people are really scrutinizing you, you have yeah. something yeah. solid. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you do what you do to get the foot in the door. And again, interpersonal thing. Everybody knows people. Those people know people. There are ways. There are, in the book I talk about, you know, if you don't have enough money for a wardrobe, there are charities that will provide you with a suit or appropriate business attire to go on interviews for. There are ways. There are ways. But you became, waiting for you're looking for those ways. Right. Became there. You're you know, rather than rather than just turning it over, you're saying you know, I'm just going to do what you show me. You're saying, show me what to do and help me look. In other words, my reason, my discernment is important. My reason and discernment is important as a spiritual being. I'm going to exercise it with whatever spiritual power you're working with. You know what I mean? Do you understand? That, yeah, but that, that also, I guess, what I thought was in you know, I wouldn't even know where to begin with the steps. Like, I wouldn't know where was Jupiter and Earth and Venus and how all that. Well, you know, the, the magical tech aspect of it is something that you can these days learn on the internet or, or learn from books. You know, in my book, I give, if for people that, most people, I assume, that pick up my books, it's not their first book on magic. Um, but, if it is, I give, you know, if you need a better background on, on the basics, I give, you know, always give examples in the book of other books to learn from. Uh, it's like anything else. They, you just, you know, if you're interested in magic, these days, you go online and Google is your friend. Can I make a suggestion to the young lady? Yeah. Um, since uh, the magic tech that you don't know where to begin, might I suggest to visit Enchantments down on East Ninth Street. Um, they are extremely talented young people who are witches. Yep. And they are very happy to share knowledge, if you, especially if you're a beginner. Um, they'll talk to you about color, they'll talk to you, you know, colors. Um, and who to invoke, and if you even if you care to, they could carve a candle for you to start you on your journey, or not, you know. But they can point out the different little bits of ingredients that you might take home and do yourself, if you feel for that. But 
you know, within a, a certain limits, you can pick their brains to some degree. In Chapman's East Ninth Street. Yeah. Okay. What avenue is that? So between A and First now, they were there, and then they had to go there. So the a bigger store now. Between A and First. Yes. Yeah. So also, also on Lady uh, Maria's um, book. Uh, yeah. Or book Lady Maria's book. Yes. Lady Maria has a that she's 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 originals in the Bronx. The Primer. The yeah. Primer. Yeah. Or in two weeks, show up for a painting fun day and talk to people there. Maria. Maria. R H. R H E A. Yeah. She did the original Botanica. Yeah, she was there. Yeah. I mean, I you can tell her I sent you. Me and I are friends. My high priestess. You mentioned before invoking angels, guides, I think, and demons. Why would anybody want to trust the demon? Well, that's a very good question. Well, you know what? It's a very good question. Well, I think from, uh, I, my, parent, my mother was uh, especially influenced by Zoroastrianism, and I would wonder why you know, anybody would want to invoke a demon. It's a very good question. And there, there are a number of different answers. For some people, the dualist view of the spiritual world is a fallacy. So that Zor that that dualism that comes ultimately from Zoroastrianism, mm -hmm. they would say that's a fallacy, that the angels and demons things is arbitrary, that the gods of the religion that we don't like become demons, and the gods of the religions that we do like become angels, and that's the way it goes. Working with demons is not really fundamentally different, and if I have a problem with the Christian church, I might be better off dealing with demons. And in many cases, you can look at the demons and, for that matter, the angels of the Christian tradition and the grimoire tradition and trace them back to Canaanite, Phoenician, Babylonian, and so on, gods. Um, Astaroth, for instance, a very popular demon that appears in several grimoires, can be traced right back to the goddess Astarte. Um, now, what I would say is that if she's a Starte, then you're still going to get a different result if you approach a Starte as a pagan and say, you know, a Starte, wise goddess, etc., help me out, versus I am going to draw a circle, force you into a triangle, by the name of the Lord Jehovah, start off, you are bound, and if you don't do exactly what I say, I'm going to burn your seal, and so on and so forth. Well, then it's like jacking somebody up against the wall and forcing them to do what you want. You might get what you, them to do what you want, but they're, you know, somebody doing something under duress and somebody doing something because they like you can be done too. Jason, before we, before we continue with questions and answers, I, I have a, 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 mic, a macro and a micro point to make. Um, macro, the ongoing vision of Gnostic NYC is to continue to present excellent speakers and lectures and workshops like this, um, and eventually to be in our own our own space where we can have, you know, things every day. Um, the micro part of this is um, raising money to pay the rent for this space every week. <laughs> and, Andrew and Emlyn has a, a basket if you can um, and help us with the expenses. She's gonna she's gonna bring that around as we continue the discussion, but. Uh, I would be remiss, particularly at this workshop, not to uh, not to bring this up. Very, very important. Yes, sir. I wanted to make a point. Um, I, I was reading about um, King Solomon, how he um, in, called up the demons to build the temple of God. And the one thing that they had said, I, I mean, I'm not saying this is true, but this is one of the reasons, is that um, you you call on the demons to do the work rather than the angels because the angels will only work for the God for God and the demons will work for man. Well see that's another aspect. If you could and control this is another viewpoint of it. Yeah. There's a viewpoint where the demons are there, the demons are amok, the demons are in fact, if not evil, mm. we'll call them wild spirits. Soccer hooligans of the spiritual world. <laughs> And what you're doing by putting them to meaningful work is actually taking your place in the spiritual hierarchy where God, angels, humans, and now you're shining, giving them access to that light 
by allowing it to pass through you and giving them work to do, just as uh, spiritual beings give you work. So that's another view that people take. Other views that people take are that demons are simply sublunary spirits. So they are spirits that are more connected to the material plane than higher spiritual planes. Therefore, they are more fast-acting. They will give you what you want without, you know, worrying about what you need in a, in a spiritual sense, which may be good, maybe bad. But they are, they don't think in terms of millennia, or they think in terms of the here and now much more like we do. So they're, they're closer. So there's a lot of reasons that people might work with demons. There's a lot of reasons that classical grimoires were written um, you know, the medieval and renaissance period that invoked demons. Um, most of them, however, are not uh, written from a satanic perspective. Almost all of them are written from a, uh, a Catholic perspective, from, you know, this is to be done by a priest or something like that. I, I fully differentiate between Wiccan and satanic. So that's not, that's not the issue. Not. The issue is I knew the person who many years ago in college got involved in this and he was very psychic and he became literally possessed and it drove him into another form of demon possession which is being baptized as a Christian fundamentalist but that's another that's, <laughs> so my thing on this is not from a Christian perspective at all is that most psychic researchers will say that there are some things out there that should not be that are against the human race why would it? I understand, like the Jung talks about the shadow, which is, can be used as part of, you know, that's, but that's not the same thing as demon. Right? No. <coughs> but with the you know, with pentagram up and pentagram down, I understand it completely. You know? Even then, pentagram <laughs> down, you know, the reverse pentagram is a second degree second sign. Exactly. And, There's no um, sign. Right. But, you know, it's. What I'm getting at is that there are different views of it. And, and, you know, as far as, like, wild spirits or spirits that are harmful, you know, one of the, people talk about demons all the time, and people think, like, fairy and nature spirits sounds all fluffy. You want to talk about a group of spirits pissed off at us. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, nature spirits. And when you go to traditional cultures, a, a good deal of traditional medicine is done to, to facilitate life between and, and existence between humans and the way that we live and beings that are essentially nature spirits. And in Nepal, they talk about mamos that get angered from burning garbage outside, and nagas that get angered yeah. from polluted streams, and bathing in sacred spots, and uh, Zay that get upset by uh, electricity and things like this. So, or get excited, I should say, by electricity. And Jalpos that are attracted by anger and things like this. So, um, to take it out of that dualistic, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys, pew, 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 you know, heavenly war kind of way, there is just sort of this, well, we live in sort of a, you know, all beings have a certain impact on their environment and they impact you know, is never just on ourselves. No man is an island, we don't all live in bubbles. Everybody impacts and influences each other, as I've said before. Does anybody we we have now officially entered the question and answer. As we can you can you just say just so we have it uh, where we can find you and what people need to know about you? Oh I'm right here. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I my I'm going to hand these out. Strategic sorcery is what you want to Google. There My website is innominandum.com. I'm going to change that soon, strategic sorcery. Uh, innominandum is sort of my writing name, my professional name, because there are famous Jason Millers that are, you know, there's Jason Miller, the actor and playwright who is in The Exorcist, and then there's Jason Miller, the <laughs> MMA fighter. So, Jason Miller, the occultist, you know, no matter how well my book sells, is always going to come lower on a Google search. So, Inominandum is the magical name that I had used for decades, and 
it's just not very easy to spell. So now that I'm doing interviews and giving talks and things like this, I say, oh, no, but I don't know how do you spell it. Here it is. Uh, but you can Google strategic sorcery, and you'll find it. Don't forget about it. Um, so as I mentioned, I have uh, financial sorcery. I have the Sorcerer's Secrets, which is more a book of um, magical techniques to feel guide to practical magic overall. Uh, not necessarily designed to be somebody's first experience in magic, but definitely their second or third. And I'm also the author of the Strategic Sorcery Training Course, uh, which is a year-long course done entirely through email. Uh, and then my first book is Protection and Reversal Magic, uh, which is not a bad first book since uh, you know, knowing how to protect yourself once you set on the path is probably the first thing you should learn how to do. Yeah. So that is me and who I am. And uh, you can find me at inomenandum at gmail.com. That's I-N-O-M-I-N-A-N-D-U-M. -N -N we have 15 minutes left. Do we have any questions? Q Yes, I do. Yes. Um, how much, you mentioned that you just had a, and you have a family and what have you. How much is that, you know, you, uh, society tends to put pressure on you to become a protector and provider for your family. Mm -hmm. How much is that more of a motivation for you to pursue this path of writing books? Because you have your children, you have to provide for them, you have to protect them, you have to I mean, that's the situation. Well, you know, all occult authors are fabulously wealthy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, um, you know, writing occult books is not the path to uh, riches. I'll say that. So you do it um, primarily, you do it because you do magic because you love it and you feel called to it. You teach it because people start asking you to teach it and you feel called to answer their their requests. Um, I didn't become a magical teacher because I set out from the beginning, like, you know, I want to teach magic so I can learn it. Some people these days are, in fact, doing that. It blows my mind. Why? Um, you know, do it because you want to do it, not because you want to become a master of, of teaching it. Um, and then you make a business out of it, yeah, partially because when you have a family to support and so on, um, if it's not earning money, it's losing money. And that's true of, of, of anything. If you have a group like Gnostic NYC, if it's not earning money, it's losing money. There is no breaking even, really. Am I wrong? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you can't perfectly balance the budget. It, it, you have to have a business plan for it to earn money or lose money. So money is also connected with time. You know, when you have a family and so on and so forth, it's one thing to say, you know, well, I'm going to trot off to New York for the, the day or off to here for a few days to teach uh, or, or to do some kind of magic project, see a later hunt. Take care, have fun taking care of the toddlers. Um, but it is another thing to say, well, you know, this is part of our business model as a family. So yeah, it is a big part of it. Also, um, being in a relationship, uh, you know, you're living with someone, and sometimes you're living with someone, and they may not be into magic, and it's, it, it is, it's, a, it's a problem. Sometimes you get, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that my my. Um, my wife mm -hmm. is tolerant, you know, <laughs> because she, you know, she's pretty much similar to what I'm into. But, but uh, how do you deal with that? Because, uh, because society puts a kind of a negative slant on occultism, and um, it, it could be very difficult. Well, you know, if you have, um, you know, my wife is not a, a magical practitioner. I would say she's psychic as heck. Uh, but she's respectful of what I do, and, and uh, that's really all that I, you know, 
wanted as far as that goes. I didn't, you know, require somebody who is into it. Well, some people would. Some people uh, feel that their partner needs to be a partner in their magic as well. Some people don't. I would say if you're with somebody who, and you feel strongly called towards occultism or fringe religion or... I mean, some people, it's not even like as weird as we do. I know some people who are just Catholics of a contemplative bent. You know, they like Richard Rohr or, or, uh, or um, Carl McCullman or something like that, two Catholic authors who write about contemplative tradition. Of the Catholic, you know, I mean, Richard Rohr is a Benedictine priest. Um, but there are, you know, there are people, their wives are hardcore conservative Catholics, and that's mysticism, evil. He should be excommunicated. Uh, it's a problem, but that's you know that's something that you always has to be worked out between two people. There's no cookie cutter answer for that one. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit uh, to the glyphs that oh. are in your book? They, I, I own the book already, um, it, and the glyphs are um, beautiful. You know, from an art point of view, but um, the the uh, the uncrossing one, which happened to appear on Gordon's right. uh, room suit a week or two or a month before your book was published, I started doodling it while I was reading him, and it just got left around the house because I doodled it four or five times. Um, quite interesting. And just every, just bunches of nonsense. Well, wow. the, what she's talking about are the lightning glyphs. The lightning glyphs, yeah. Now, as I was writing this book, Oof. I was invoking Jupiter yeah. fairly heavily. And I'm part of a group called the Gentlemen for Jupiter, who mm -hmm. works this Jupiterian current. And there. as I yep. <laughs> as I was writing the book, um, I was in communication with Jupiter and had asked for him to convey um, some magic that could be used that would be a benefit to people that read the book. So he conveyed an invocation, an invocation of four goddesses, as you know. Um, and then he said, well, you know, there's this thing that comes through, but you have to get your friend Matt. <laughs> Because I'm not an artist, and Matt Brownlee uh, is my best friend, and he's a tattoo artist uh, in, in the Philadelphia area, oh. it's in media PA. And he did the planetary, the specialized planetary seals in the Sorcerer's Secrets, and of course he did the Jupiter seal on the cover of this book, the specialized seal. Um, so Jupiter said, you know, I have these glyphs I want to communicate to you, but you you can't draw, dude. So Matt came over, and Matt is also a magician. So we sat down in the living room, and, and uh, I invoked Jupiter. And uh, all of a sudden, it was just, you know, it just came really fast and really furious. And, and it, it was all very casual, too. It wasn't, um, you know, there was no circle. We weren't in robes or anything like that. And we did the invocation in my living room. And, uh, both of us could sort of see the place becoming, the air just becoming really heavy, and, and I get to a point where I can't even see across the room. But we would get this, okay, the next one is for reversing bad luck. And he would just instantly, like, whip it off. Like, all 16 glyphs were done in this, and, and a few others that are remaining hidden, um, <laughs> were, uh, were whipped off within the span of an hour, less than an hour. Um, it was all just lightning fast, and, uh, you know, we, I started releasing the bits almost immediately to some people, so uh, people had been using them in business and, and uh you know, for promoting different things like the viral glyph and so on and getting good results back. Because I, I have a rule, I try never to put anything in a book that either I haven't experimented with or, or uh, other people haven't experimented with. And so, um, you know.